Welcome to another Six Patterns video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And uh, today we are continuing on our series of the top 25 pearls of pulmonary pathology. Awesome. And uh, we're about a third of the way into it now. Yeah. And uh, we're looking forward to today's session. Great. So what's our topic today? So this case, uh, this, is, this is in the general category of the importance of clinical and radiographic data in your pathologic interpretation. And I don't think we'll get to the exact topic until we go through and we take a look at this case. Yeah, yeah. cool. So, so the story. What is the story on this wedge biopsy of lung that we have? My, my history sheet says 60-year-old female, cough and shortness of breath, bilateral patchy infiltrates. 60-year-old female. 60-year-old woman, cough and shortness of breath. That seems like an unusual history. <laughs> Shortness of breath and, and cough. Cough, <laughs> cough and shortness, shortness of, of breath. breath. Patchy bilateral infiltrates on imaging, and we're not going to tell you more about them because the budding radiologists or fully formed radiologists who are watching this video, if we told you all the details of the CT as we look at it, you'd probably guess what this patient has. You might be able to. That's the beauty of the CT. Sometimes it trumps and overrides the biopsy, even. Right. <laughs> Okay, so a surgical wedge biopsy is done. It comes to you. You scan it at 2x, as Max is doing here in our digital slide. Pink or blue? Looks kind of pink to Looks me. Looks like kind of pink biopsy, so we're thinking about fibrosis, yeah. acute lung injury patterns. Yeah, and fibrosis well. or acute lung injury. And you know the thing about the pink on the biopsy is, to me, there's also too much tissue here. Oh, you know, absolutely. If you look at enough lung biopsy, lung tissues around like tumors, you, you almost stop looking at the lung parenchyma because it's so it's so delicate, so almost invisible under the microscope. Barely and low there. magnification, barely there. Barely there. This biopsy is way too much here. Absolutely, way too much pink. And you can see, right? Remember, radiology. Anything that's not air is going to look white or opaque on the CT scan. And so all of this stuff here Should is white. what is giving you that CT appearance of bilateral infiltrates. And increased attenuation is the way that we Increased goes. attenuation, yeah. which I like to just say white because yeah. I'm not that smart <laughs> exactly. to talk about Plus. attenuation. Yeah. So it looks like they biopsied the radiographic lesion of concern. Right. So we have a woman shortness of breath, cough, bilateral infiltrates. We have a biopsy that shows the infiltrate. And so we have already decided it's a pink biopsy. We go to a little bit higher power to get a better idea of what exactly wow. is going on with this biopsy. Yeah, that fibrosis is kind of star-shaped to me. I mean, it's not completely star-shaped, but where it's thick, where the scars are big, they kind of have a, a starfish-like look, don't a, they? A little bit of a, a star-shaped look, but you know, it's kind of everywhere, right? Yeah. I mean, some most of this fibrosis is yeah. all over the place. Yeah. And it's expanding the interstitium. Yeah. Pretty yeah. evenly, right? Yeah. Except where it's not. Except where it's not. <laughs> but even where it's not, it kind of is changing it a little bit. Yeah. I but I can still see some normal lung in here. My eye always catches the normal lung yeah. off to the side. That's kind of weird. Uh, it's weird if you've got a diffuse disease, but it only affects part only of the lung biopsy? part of the lung that's involved. So he, he, here's the story on this case. This case came to us because it was diagnosed as fibrotic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Wow. Yeah. And you could see why that diagnosis might be rendered, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it's a fibrosing process. It's generally expanding the interstitium. Most yeah. of the biopsy is involved. Yeah, why is it not fibrotic NSIP? So that is the question. And that's the, that's why this case got sent out. The pulmonologist was like, I don't think this patient has fibrotic NSIP. Actually, I think this patient has a smoking problem because she's got a 60-pack year smoking history. Yeah, but, you know, I hate to be the devil's advocate, but I think that that clinician knew something about the CT that we haven't mentioned. Well, of course, the clinician knew something about the CT. They're not going to give you all the answers. So why is that important? Because if you look at the CT scan, and most of the abnormalities are in the lower lung zones and peripheral, you think about 
vascular diseases and like things like collagen vascular disease, which is the number one cause of fibrotic NSIP. So the clinician was saying, this makes no sense to me. I've got a patient who's got upper lobe dominant disease and you're telling me it's NSIP? Send the case out. Exactly. So this brings up the pearl of the case and, and the pearl of the case, actually we run across this on a daily basis is that smoking related pathology is very common and it actually mimics a lot of other pulmonary patterns of pathology. Right. Things and like it mimics UIP, it mimics, mimics UIP, fibrotic NSIP, it mimics airway centered scarring of other inhalational disease like yep. hypersensitivity pneumonitis or pneumoconiosis. Yep. It mimics airspace filling disease yep. like in the DIP, DIP reaction. And macrophage reactions. Patients who smoke can get eosinophilic pneumonia, so it can mimic it can acute, acute lung injury patterns too. So it is a it is a a, a very common abnormality to encounter smoking related pathology and how to handle it becomes a, a, a challenge. First See, to recognize it's smoking and then how to sign these biopsies out. Yeah, and then we can talk about what the clinician can do about it. So what sounds to me like you're saying that smoking related diseases are like the syphilis of the lung. A, a little bit. A little bit, okay. A little bit. It's not syphilis in the lung. No, Okay. it's the syphilis yeah. of the lung. Of the lung, okay, good. So how, how would I distinguish this case of what superficially could be interpreted as fibrotic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia as actually representing a smoking related interstitial lung disease? What are clues that could help me? Well, you know, one of the things, one of the helpful things or not helpful things, I see these little blue aggregates around here mm -hmm. and I can't tell, low mag, is there lymphocyte, little lymphoid aggregates? Yep. Not germinal centers, maybe. Nope, just, just little just aggregates. Aggregates of lymphocytes, lymphocytes near the fibrosis. But it doesn't look like an inflammatory fibrosis because where we see the fibrosis prominently, there's very little inflammation. So it's almost like it's a bronchiolitis. Exactly. So to me, that's one of the key points. In most cases of fibrotic NSIP, there's at least a sprinkling of a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate because the these are often immunologic mediated. And so you have some plasma cells, some lymphocytes sprinkled within the fibrosis. This fibrosis is almost acellular. It's posse cellular and there's absolutely no lymphoplasmacytic yeah. inflammatory cell infiltrate. So if you see a case like this and it's got this dense collagen bands of fibrosis and there's no lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, you should stop and think, what else could this be besides fibrotic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia? And look at that, right in the middle of the field there, there's a big giant band of thick, smooth muscle. Now, you know, there's been a lot of controversy about where smooth muscle comes from in fibrotic lung disease, but I have a simple idea that most of the smooth muscle in the lung is in the arteries, the veins, and in the airways. airways. So the airways have a sheath of smooth muscle. I think when you see bands of muscle like that in scar, I think it does suggest that there might have been an airway nearby. And in fact, this might be an airway the right residual there. of that airway right there. So how are you going to separate them? What are you going to, what tests are you going to do in your mind? So that what we're making these videos for is to give you pearls and to hopefully help you navigate the spectrum of disease we're talking about, in this case, smoking related disease. So ask the question about the CT. The imaging should not show a lower lobe dominant process. Right. Cases of advanced Langerhans cell histiocytosis on, in explant pathology, if you look at the cross section of the lung, you'll see the fibrosis comes down from the apex almost to the base, but the bases are relatively spared. It's kind of the reverse of a UIP where the apices tend to have the least amount of involvement. Exactly. So in a case where you're worried about smoke related disease, knowledge of what the CT shows is absolutely critical. Number two. Knowledge of smoking habits. Smoking habits. Clinical knowledge of smoking habits. <laughs> so how about this lesion here? Is that helpful in our, in our differential diagnosis here between fibrotic NSIP and smoking related pathology? It's kind of like a focal disquamative interstitial pneumonia pattern with alveolar filling by macrophages and they're kind of smoking related macrophages meaning they're lightly pigment dusty pigmented sometimes they have a little chunky iron in them yep uh but this is kind of a characteristic look to a smoker's macrophage right and if we had this aggregated around a terminal bronchiole 
without all this associated fibrosis, we'd call this respiratory bronchiolitis. Yeah, right? yeah we got it. and we have those little nodules of inflammation that goes along with it. Respiratory bronchiolitis requires a little bit of chronic inflammation around a slightly remodeled, minimally fibrotic airway accompanied by macrophage, airspace macrophage. Exactly. So we have, we have other evidence on this biopsy in addition to the uh, distribution of the fibrosis to suggest that this might be smoking-related pathology. And then back to what you were getting at at the beginning is that we have areas of lung that look completely normal. That are completely normal. This is a thin, delicate alveolar wall. Just a one pneumocyte, a basement membrane, capillary network, yeah another basement membrane, another pneumocyte, perfectly normal alveolar wall. And really in fibrotic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, because it's a diffuse immunologic vascular process, you should not see completely normal alveolar walls. This is what gets pathologists in trouble with calling cases like this UIP, because they read the description of UIP, patchy lung fibrosis with normal lung, quote unquote, windows of normal lung, and that looks like a window of normal lung, so why isn't this UIP then? That's a good question. What haven't we seen for UIP? There's no honeycombing. No fibroblast foci. There's no destructive scarring and honeycombing. There's no fibroblast foci. And the demarcations between the where you see fibrosis and you don't see fibrosis here Unclean. are very vague. Yeah. So it's that, that the way that you can't, that the lung doesn't interface abruptly with a wall of fibrosis. That's a very characteristic UIP pattern of scarring. Normal lung abutting a thick area of scar in the lung. And everywhere you see normal lung, there will be scar right nearby. Exactly. So how would you go about, uh, so is there anything else well, to distinguish smoking from no, and I think even if they told me this patient wasn't a smoker, then I'd say, well, th this is a, a smoking-related pattern of fibrosis. Maybe the patient is secondhand smoke. Maybe the patient was a smoker and forgot, which I guess can happen. Could happen. So, so if if you have the clinical history and the imaging studies in this case, you know the patient's a smoker. You know this is upper low predominant right. ground glass opacities or increased attenuation. Then we could look at this biopsy and we could say, okay, we think this is all related to smoking, but how the heck do I put my report together? Yeah, I sign them out as smoking-related interstitial lung disease with... As long as you know that the patient has interstitial lung disease, you can do that. Right. Right? Correct. Because in that setting, you know the patient has ILD. You can't call it smoking-related interstitial lung disease if you see some of these changes in your lobectomy specimen for tumor. Right. Meaning if the patient didn't come to the table, surgical table because they have ILD. Stay away from diagnosing smoking-related disease because it's usually a nuisance finding. It has no clinical correlation. It's an untreatable lesion other than smoking cessation, right. which brings us to this patient. If this patient has a severe pulmonary function deficit at this point, it's unlikely to get better because scar has no brain. This does not make a decision to go away. This scar is right. here, the lung is remodeled. This is as good as it's gonna get. So this is a perfect time to have that conversation with the patient saying, look, you might wanna take up vaping. <laughs> Sorry. Or something else. Something to, to, right. to decrease your desire to smoke a cigarette. But you know, maybe a nicotine patch. Smoking, aggressive smoking cessation programs are what clinicians advise to patients who have smoking related interstitial lung disease. Exactly. Some of these patients will require a lung transplant, believe it or not. Now, smoking related interstitial lung disease is an encompassing term. Right. And it encompasses what we just described as respiratory bronchiolitis. That's its most benign variation. Right. And it encompasses desquamative interstitial pneumonia, which it's is its rarest manifestation, which is probably on a spectrum with respiratory bronchiolitis. Right. And it encompasses what Kevin brought up in the very first observation here, the possibility of remote pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis with some of these centrolobular stellate scars. Perhaps this is a old fibrotic phase of PLCH. Right, and this patient's uh, in the right age to have quote unquote burned out Langerhans cell histiocytosis. We don't know what the incidence of it is in smokers. No studies have ever shown what the incidence is. We do know that patient, younger patients tend to have more than one stage of lesion. But the remote smokers or older patients may have only burned out scar. They may not have any active Langerhans cell aggregates. 
So when, the, when you say smoking related, your clinical colleague will say, did you do the stains? And that was going to be my next question. So we should do CD1A stains on every single slide in this case, no, yes? No, absolutely not. So I don't do them even when I see the Langerhans cells. I diagnose it without doing the immunohistochemistry because it's unnecessary. It's just an added time constraint expense, all the rest of it. If you see the Langerhans cells in their character distribution, you have a diagnosis. If you don't see them, doing the stain won't help you because smokers will have a few around Langerhans cells. Exactly, and they might be slightly increased. Right. But if you don't see them by H&E, you're not gonna see them it's not gonna by change your pressure. chemistry. No. So in that setting, just call it fibrotic pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis and you may move on. Right. So this pearl, smoking related pathology is common and it mimics a lot of different pulmonary pathology processes. And so hopefully with the, the session here, we've given you some pearls and some hints as to how to approach these biopsies and then how to maybe sign these biopsies out. Right. Advanced smoking related pathology consistent with smoking related ILD if you don't have clinical and radiographic right. information. Great. Thanks, Max. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, don't forget to uh, like and comment below and let us know uh, if you enjoyed this video. We'll see you next time.